watching, uh, you know, streaming Netflix while I conduct a meeting. Um, okay. Welcome everybody to uh, the March meeting of Community Board 12's Parks and Cultural Affairs Committee um, for March. Today is March 14th, Pie Day. I hope everybody got to eat, I don't know, pizza, apple pie, something for Pie Day. It's one of my favorite days of the year because I am a math nerd. Um, I just want to see if we have quorum. We got Daryl, Danny, B, Luana, Naima. Sounds like quorum to me. We've got Alexis Marnell joining us in a few minutes. Um, so we have quorum and I'm calling this meeting to order at 634. Uh, thank you all for joining me um, and for coming on. Um, most of this meeting is going to be devoted to um, J. Hood Wright Park. Um, and I thank everybody for coming to that. I see that we've got 43 attendees, many of whose names I recognize and scrolling through uh, many of whom I don't recognize. So I'm guessing you all are new to the committee um, and new to, the, to these meetings. Thank you for coming and welcome. I do see in the participants, we have a couple of people by the same name. So we have two, Stephanie Caban, we got three, Spencer Badish, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, Leslie Atkinson's. So those are people who all shared like a link. Um, Nothing wrong with that, but you know, I always like to know who's actually in a meeting. It helps us for attendance purposes, and it also helps me to be able to address you by name. So if your name is something other than uh, Leslie Atkinson, Spencer Badish, and Stephanie Caban, if you could please use the feature up in the, uh, in the upper right corner, uh, in your display, there should be three dots where you can change your name. It'll say at the bottom of the menu, if you click on that, rename, and just rename it with, you know, your name. Um, and that will help us to know who's actually in the meeting. Uh, without further ado, I got a bunch of announcements. Um, I want to uh, let folks know that uh, Maria Luna is being added to this committee. Uh, that just happened. So I believe she's not here this evening because she had a previous engagement, but we will uh, look forward to seeing her next month on the committee. Uh, she brings a wealth of experience in the community and also deep familiarity with the Southern end of the district. Always important to have good geographical representation throughout the, uh, the district. Um, NOMA, the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, is opening their Women in the Heights uh, art exhibition. The opening reception is March 23rd. A little bit of a personal plug. I do have a piece in there. I'm very pleased. Um, uh, that's at the United Palace uh, at 4140 Broadway. Uh, the Hispanic Society is reopening after uh, more than a six-year hiatus they closed, their last open day was December 31st, 2016. And I am very excited uh, that they are finally, finally, finally reopening next month. There will be a lift so that the galleries are, uh, most of the galleries are accessible. One of the galleries does have um, a lift, a lip, so you cannot get into that on your own if you were in a wheelchair, but the terrace will be accessible by virtue of the lift. This is great news. Um, and I look forward to hearing more from Guillaume Kainz, who will be attending our meeting next month to uh, give us an update on some of the great programming stuff. Um, unfortunately, many of our friends are on tour in uh, visiting exhibitions around the globe, but they still have lots of great stuff in their collection, and I can't wait for that museum to reopen. Um, 
the parks department did another public input session for the Lily Brown playground. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, and I don't know if they're on the call to um, staff at uh, Council Member Abreu's office for um, helping to put that together and shout out to Ramon Toribio and Veronica Liu from Word Up who made sure that there was an in-person venue um, for folks who don't have easy access to, um, to uh, Zoom and to the internet. They were able to go and access the meeting uh, in person through a, a computer and screen setup. They took a page out of the council member, Carmen De La Rosa uh, playbook and the connectivity that her staff provided for uh, this committee at some other meetings regarding the basketball on 186th Street. So I think that's a really good working model and I love that uh, that's happening more. Um, hmm. uh, the Bonifant, which is the uh, new restaurant concession in uh, Fort Tryon Park where the New Leaf Cafe used to be, um, is on schedule, on track, according to the um, proprietor, the operator for opening in June. So that is exciting. Um, the Inwood Film Festival is going to be happening back in person on Memorial Day weekend. And if you go to their website, there's, there should be some information about that and on Eventbrite for buying tickets, but that's always, it's a wonderful, wonderful festival of um, movies made in, by, and or about uh, Inwood and Washington Heights. Um, what else have we got? You would think I would be able to read my own handwriting after all of these years. Um, our next meeting will not be on the second Tuesday. Our next meeting will be on April 18th uh, due to the Passover holiday. And we will be focused on enforcement issues in the parks. Uh, we were originally planning on doing a joint meeting with the Public Safety Committee, but the Public Safety Committee is in big demand in April. They are meeting jointly with Traffic and Transportation. And it just seemed kind of unfair to make them have to meet twice. So with their blessing and the blessing of the board chair, I've reached out to uh, some of our friends at the 34th and the 33rd precinct, to folks at Parks Enforcement. Thank you, Jennifer, for connecting me there. Uh, Urban Park Rangers, uh, folks from the Corner Project will be attending as well. And we can have um, a productive conversation on um, security and public safety and sanitation issues as we go into the summer. I think that is it. Oh, um, in sad news uh, for people who knew um, Marjorie Elliott, who know Marjorie Elliott, she's fine. She's fine. Uh, her son, Sean, uh, died um, a couple of days ago and there is a funeral service for him tomorrow at 10 at Church of the Intercession on Broadway and 155th Street. Uh, for those of you who don't know Marjorie Elliott, she is whew, a bedrock, a bedrock in this community and her Sunday afternoon uh, jazz parlor jazz sessions have been going on every week without fail for well over a decade, maybe 15 years. Um, she's a neighborhood institution and, uh, and a hell of a pianist. Um, so she's given us so much. Um, our thoughts are with her at this time. Um, I'm seeing that some people are asking about um, mic and video enabled, the way the, this format works is if you've joined, it, you can stream on our YouTube channel, which doesn't have a participation option, or if you are on Zoom, you can hear what's going on and using the raise hand feature, uh, I will call on you so that you uh, have the opportunity to speak. Um, I do, want to let people know that in terms of the agenda, 
Uh, our next item on the agenda is going to be programming updates, which is 90 second to two minute updates from parks and cultural affairs organizations. And then uh, Jennifer is going to give some announcements about parks programming and some updates on um, capital projects in the community. There is a question in the chat, uh, what's going on with the refurbishment of Bennett Park? And there has been in the news recently how artificial turf has been linked to cancer. Uh, how different is the one approved for Bennett Park Center area? So if you could just speak to that uh, when you give your report, Jennifer, I would appreciate that. Um, and yeah, so we're gonna, and then the main item of the agenda is uh, talking about things going on in J. Hood Wright Park. So folks who are uh, representing parks and cultural affairs organizations, uh, you can raise your hands if you would like to make a presentation. Um, first up, I see Martin Collins. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Liz. And uh, as Liz said uh, at the top, uh, Women in the Heights, our exhibit with uh, 52 artists will uh, open on Thursday, March 23rd at 6 p.m. We encourage you to join us. It's free with RSVP on our website, nomanyc.org. The 21st Uptown Art Stroll Poster Contest at submissions are accepted through April 2nd. You can submit a photo, an image, or artwork uh, on our website, nomanyc.org, for a chance to win a $1,500 grand prize, $750 second, and a $500 third prize. The Uptown Art Stroll opening reception, and we invite everybody to attend, is on Thursday, June 1st, from 6 to 8.30 p.m. at the Sugar Hill Museum on St. Nicholas Avenue and 155th Street. Please join us at this free event. And also you can submit your events as an artist or arts organization anytime on our website to our calendar and we will promote them in our weekly newsletter and social media. And I wanna remind everybody that the Uptown Art Stroll printed guide deadline is April 30th. All the events, including those received after the deadline will be published in the online calendar. The stroll is the entire month of June in Washington Heights, Inwood and West Harlem, showcasing the performing and visual arts uptown. You should sign up for our newsletter to stay informed at nomanyc.org. And finally, we invite everyone to a pre-Arts Stroll concert on Tuesday, May 9th at 7.30 p.m. with American jazz pianist and composer Emmett Cohen and uh, Grammy nominee saxophonist Miguel Zenon at the Harlem School of the Arts on 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. Please note there is a $10 suggested donation to benefit the Harlem School of the Arts summer camp students that evening. That's Tuesday, May 9th. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say, uh, before I call on the next person, someone said, this guy better be a radio host with a voice like that. He's not a radio host, but he does announce, uh, he does announce uh, uh, sports games at several uh, institutions of higher learning. So, Yes, yes, Dominic, you are correct. Mark <laughs> Collins has absolutely golden, golden vocals. Thank he you. also to... is a great singer. I'm sorry, Marty. Hi. Thank you. I'm going to put you on the spot. Po yeah. Point of clarification, point of order. He's a great singer. Yes, he Thank is. you. And by the way, Liz, if I may, uh, Saturday, April 15th, noon, is the uh, Inwood Little League's 73rd annual Inwood Little League opening day parade, marching from Dykeman and Broadway all the way up to Inwood Hill Park. Uh, so if you want to hear that uh, national anthem, you can show up then and see a wonderful uh, opening day uh, festivities and ceremony. And following that event, uh, I guess about 1, 1 1.15, we will go over to 204th and uh, uh, Cooper, Seaman Avenue, where the street will be co-named that day, Jimmy Nolan Way, in, in, in uh, honor of the uh, Jimmy Nolan, rest his soul, who passed away. He's the former Inwood Little League president and uh, treasurer and was involved in the league for over 50 years. That'll be at noon, the parade, and then about 1 130, the co-naming on 204th Seaman Avenue, Cooper Street on Saturday, April 15th. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Next up, Stephanie Caban. 
from Riverside uh, Park Conservancy. Hey Liz. Hi everyone. Um, just have two announcements today. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie. Uh, I'm from Riverside Park Conservancy. I'm the North Park Outreach Coordinator. Um, and two awesome things that are happening this summer. Um, we have a teen core program running this summer where we are inviting high school youth who live alongside Riverside Park, um, Riverside Drive uh, from 110th all the way up. Um, we are inviting any teens in the air who live in that area to come and join us for a paid internship this summer where they get to learn about horticulture, environmental justice, um, and can work side by side with our gardeners. So um, that's a really exciting program. Um, and then second, we are also opening up summer camp in Fort Washington Park. Um, I, we usually have summer camp on one, 102nd Street, uh, kind of near the, uh, the, soccer, the soccer fields. We are having that as well. Um, we're just adding an additional camp at Fort Washington, which is really, really exciting. Um, we're going to have gymnastics up there as well, which is something new. Um, so if anybody is interested in any of these two programs, I'm going to put that down in the chat um, as well. Uh, definitely here to be a super big supporter and advocate for J-Head Ray, our neighbor park. Uh, super excited for them uh, to have this meeting. Um, I think that's it, but I'll stay on for the rest of the meeting for any questions. Thank you. Oh, and sorry, I'm, I'm on to devices so you see two stephanies i am so sorry about that <laughs> you know what that's that's fine if if you're on two devices and there's two stephanies because there's only one you that's all good um if you could do Three. me a favor though and just send me a quick email with a summary of uh what your comments are uh that makes a uh, minute taking much easier for me <laughs> and i respectfully request that uh, uh i already got from marty but anybody else who's giving a report for their group if they could do that as well you got uh, it thank you Thank you so much. Next up, we have Julie McCoy from the Inwood Canoe Club. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm Julie McCoy, a commoner of the Inwood Canoe Club, and uh, got a couple of things to mention here. So this past weekend, um, on March 11th, we had the first of our shore cleanup events. Uh, these are events that we can have for the public, even when the water is too cold to go out on the water. This was something that was co-sponsored with Word Up Community Bookstore. Uh, we had, uh, I actually, yes, we had about 14, I think maybe 15 people uh, show up. And we are developing future ideas to, with Word Up for shore cleanups. And we're also hoping to put together some story time reading events at the Boathouse. Our first open house program for 2023 will be Sunday, May 28th. That should be the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. As usual, mornings from approximately 10 until uh, 12. We do invite people to come join us for short excursions on the Hudson River. Uh, we are developing some additional programming. So I'm a, an ACA certified instructor. That's the American Canoe Association. We have two other instructors in our club. Last year, we did uh, some classes for uh, non-members, and they worked out very well. Uh, and we plan to do those again this year. We don't have dates worked out yet, but we hope to by the time of the next uh, Community Board um, 12 Parks and Culture meeting. Um, and we also have an activities committee to develop and coordinate ideas um, for programming, both for our members, but also for the public. And they are busy bees putting together a calendar. Uh, lastly, I want to mention that Uptown Paddling, which is the Inwood Canoe Club's nonprofit organization, is planning some paddling events for the following groups. Uh, City Parks Coastal Classroom, uh, the science study program known as Biobus, New Alternatives, which is a program for homeless LGBTQ youth, Navigators, which is a Harlem-based youth or outdoors group, Girl Scout Troop 3505, which is affiliated with Church of the Good Shepherd, and Cat Rock, which is an affiliate of the Sierra Club to develop leadership skills through outdoor activities. Uh, and Jennifer, I owe you an email. I think we do want to do something on Earth Day. Uh, we'll basically have a dehydrated open house. Um, it'll be too cold to go on the water, but we'll be happy to let people tour the facility. So I'll, I'll send you an email in a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to repeat for people who are just joining, um, we're having announcements and updates from parks and cultural organizations. They're doing two to three minute quick announcements about what's going on with their groups. Then uh, the next item on the agenda is Jennifer is going to give some announcements about upcoming events in the parks and is going to give a report on capital 
and programming updates. And then the main item of the agenda of this evening's meeting is J. Hood Wright Park. So my goal is to get as many voices in on that conversation as possible. We will get to that when we get to that. And I am um, requesting that folks not blow up the chat with their questions about J. Hood Wright Park. We have to have this meeting on the record. Not everybody can see the chat. This is a fully public meeting. So I would like to be able to make the time and the space for us to have a public conversation. Um, so be patient, we will get to it. Uh, next up, we have uh, Catherine Hughes from the Morris Jamel Mansion. Good evening, everybody. I wanted to just mention that tomorrow night, we have a virtual parlor chat called Espionage and Enslavement. Um, it is about the incredible life of a woman named Liss, uh, L-I-S-S, -S, who was enslaved by the Townsend family of Oyster Bay, Long Island, uh, but who we have now discovered through the work of historian and author Claire uh, Bellargeau, who is going to be talking, uh, that she contributed uh, as a spy during the Revolutionary War. So uh, if you want to find out more about Liz and her incredible life, um, you can go to our website. I'll put this in the chat uh, and register for free um, for this virtual parlor chat called Espionage and Enslavement from seven to eight tomorrow evening. Thanks, Liz. Cool, thank you. Uh, next up we have, and again, if you could send me that in an email in addition to in the chat. Um, and we've got Tracy McNeil saying, hooray, Jamel Mansion, I echo that. And last we've got, next we've got Ian Caddick from Rowe, New York. Thanks, Liz. Good evening, everyone. Um, just two quick updates from Rome, New York. Uh, we're currently enrolling eighth graders in our core rowing and academics program for spring. Um, if anyone is interested in the program or just wants any uh, info about what uh, what we're up to this spring, you can email us at info at rowneyork.org or contact us through our website. Um, we also do expect the Peter J. Sharp Boathouse to be taken away next month in April. Uh, we don't have a firm date yet. Um, as you might know, the group who's responsible for taking it away has um, had some trouble solidifying the special barge that they need in order to move it. Uh, we, we uh, of course, will be continuing to uh, offer our program at the, at the current location until our new boathouse is operational. Um, that'll do it for, for us. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. And you did say April. Um, yes. I guess last year you just didn't specify which April. <laughs> so yeah, April it's been it a is. bit of a nightmare. <laughs> I can I can only imagine. Um, okay. Last but not least, we've got um, Barbara. And Barbara, while you're talking, I'm going to attempt to share my screen, which uh, with the agenda, because someone asked sure. if I could, uh, if they could view okay. the agenda. Um, and I, I guess apologize I, for not. No doing problem. That. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, pardon me. I sound awful. Um, I'm in bed with a uh, fever and a cold, but I'll try to make it through the meeting. I just wanted to report from the Ring Garden. April 4th is going to be a fabulous event again for the children. All we thought we would end up around Thanksgiving, but all winter long, uh, there has been Rain or Shine, the children's storybook hour. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art Cloisters took it over after NYPL and has been doing a fabulous job. And they want to wrap it up on April 4th. They will be supplying a metropolitan cloisters party in the in the ring garden and there will be they will be supplying a loot player and and performance and a professional storyteller and uh even on the worst weather days there's been at least 25 kids to the weekly story hour and when the weather's a little better there's been 50 
So it's really, we expect maybe upwards of 50 children. Uh, we'll also have some refreshments. I'm going to ask Inwood Bar and Grill if they would help us out uh, with finger food. So it's really uh, a marvelous, incredible situation. Um, also, I want to tell people that this is the only place in Inwood or really Washington Heights where kids get this kind of story hour because, because of this continued COVID precautions, these kinds of events are not allowed back in the public or, or into any of the schools yet. But because the ring is out <coughs> outdoors, um, we are able to sponsor that, which has been wonderful for the kids. And clearly parents are very hung and kids are very hungry for this. We even get kids that are seven or eight years old saying to their parents, can I stay home from school today for story hour? I want to go to story hour. So it's very, very successful. So again, April 4th, Metropolitan Museum of Art Cloisters is sponsoring a story hour uh, professional storyteller um, party in the, in the ring garden um, with lute player and costumes and so forth. And that's because that's the end of their session and they're handing it back to the NYPL, which will then pick up and start again with the NYPL. So it's in the mornings. Now, I think Cassandra has gotten on now. If she could just have one minute to give the time and one one minute, Liz, if you could. Sure. Hold Is on. Cassandra Collot, because she's the one who manages the story hour. I was uh -huh. just picking up slack because yep, yep, she wasn't yep, on yep. yet. Gotcha. Cassandra, are you on? Yes, she is. Okay, unmute her. And I mute did. Me. Thank, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Cassandra, you've been unmuted. If you want to give us some information on times, we'd love to hear it. Hi, hey, Elizabeth, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, Barbara, thank you so much. For some reason, I had seven o'clock ingrained in my head. <laughs> I didn't realize it was 630. But um, yes, um, I've been facilitating the garden space. Um, as you know, um, and we, um, we don't have a literacy uh, program. We don't have story time in Inwood because our library is being... Um, it's not ready <laughs> under construction. So I've been facilitating the space um, for NYPL and they pulled out in uh, November because it was too cold and for other issues. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, quickly stepped in and has been facilitating the story time. Um, and as Barbara said, they are having kind of a transition, a, a big transition party um, where they will step out and NYPL will come back in. And that is Thursday, April 6th. And that's going to be um, at 11.30. And we're going to have entertainment. We're going to have um, a balloon maker, a face painter. And um, the Met wants to make it, quote, unquote, big. So <laughs> I don't know how big they want to make it. But the um, garden will be um, supplying um, food and drinks. And um, right after that, um, NYPL will come back. and then. Um, with the anticipation of the not being done by the winter months, because I've been asking a lot of questions. It seems like it might not be up and running until maybe January, 2024. So um, the Met, um, this young lady, um, Christina from the Met has said, if that happens and NYPL pulls out because of um, weather conditions, meaning it's too cold for them to be out there, that they would um, come back just so we would have some kind of, you know, story time, um, for the kids, for the younger kids. And just so, just to, to let you know that I have been out there every single day. We've only missed one day and that's because it was pouring, but if it's 35 degrees and over, I'm out there, the med comes out and I have, believe it or not, I have 15 to 17 kids that come out in the coldest weather. And I mean, babies, maybe from nine months to maybe two and a half that come every single Thursday. And then they even stay for what they now call the after party. Well, I'll, I'll bring, <laughs> I'll bring my radio, and um, I'll just play some kitty music, and we'll hang out for like another okay. half hour. Gotta wrap it up. <laughs> okay, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay, um, is there anybody else? I'm not seeing any more raised hands, um, so we can move on to uh, Jennifer's announcements and updates on capital and programming and 
I'm going to kill the share screen. I hope uh, people have had a chance to view the agenda. Um, okay. Jennifer. Thanks, Liz. Um, just some um, upcoming programs to highlight. Uh, if you haven't ever done so, um, please take advantage of the Urban Park Rangers um, twice monthly tours of the newly restored historic High Bridge Water Tower. Um, it's, the next one is this Saturday, March 18th, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Um, it's definitely a workout, but it's amazing the views from the top. You can see the Connecticut, New Jersey, the Palisades, um, Brooklyn, Queens. It's it's really phenomenal. And you'll get to hear how the important role our community played in bringing clean water to the entire city. Um, the Rangers are also doing a Spring Has Sprung hike starting at Margaret Corbin Circle on Sunday, March 19th from 11 to 12. Um, on Saturday, March 25th, they're going to have a connecting with nature through meditation um, workshop. That's uh, 1 p.m. at Seaman Ave and Isham Street, uh, the entrance to Inwood Hill Park. Um, and something else to highlight, um, they're going to have a super hike, a high points of the heights super hike. It's going to start at West 173rd in Fort Wash Ave, um, at J. Hood Wright Park, uh, Sunday, March 26th from 1 to 3. Um, on the tour will be, um, it'll be about history, ecology, and geology. You'll start at J. Hood Wright, you'll go to Bennett, and you'll end at Fort Tryon. Um, so it's a two-hour hike on Sunday, the 25th. If you want to uh, learn more about upcoming events, stewardship um, opportunities, um, activities in Northern Manhattan Parks, northernmanhattanparks.org, and then click on the events tab or the events um, link on the right-hand side. Um, moving on to some announcements, um, we had 800 people at our at the Parks Department's job fair this past weekend at Highbridge Recreation Center. Um, I want to thank everybody who came out to that. Um, a lot of city agencies partnered with us. Council Member De La Rosa was there. Um, if you missed it um, and you're interested in working for parks or other city agencies, another one is in development and will be held at the Ch Chelsea Recreation Center. Um, if you're not into going outside this time of year, um, there is a learning hub on the Parks Department's website, um, nycparks.org slash learn. There's wildlife information, uh, ecosystem information, tree information. You can also sign up your school group or children's group uh, for a natural classroom program um, by the Urban Park Rangers. Um, of so summer camps were mentioned earlier. This is actually the last week to sign up for New York City Parks Department summer camp lottery. Um, we've got multiple sites in the city. Um, we'll have both full day and extended day summer camp at J. Hood Wright again, starting Thursday, July 6th, ending August 18th. It's $575 for seven weeks, so it's super affordable, um, but you have to register for the lottery this week on uh, nyc.gov slash parks, um, and I'll try to put the detailed link in the chat uh, later. Um, I also want to remind people that um, the Parks Department and the City's Economic Development Corporation are moving forward on um, the Sherman Creek North, the new waterfront parks that we're developing, Academy Street east of uh, 9th Avenue, east of 10th Avenue rather, and also the 208th Street uh, waterfront park. It's a $50 million investment that the city's making. Um, we've got three upcoming sessions that uh, you can take advantage of for providing public input. One is tomorrow night um, via um, Zoom. If you just go on Eventbrite and uh, put in Academy Street and North Park. Um, you can get the link for that. Um, there's going to be a site tour if you're not a virtual meeting person and you want to walk the area. Um, this Saturday, the 18th at 10.30 a.m., meet at Academy and at 201st Street. Um, or if you want to be a part of a larger discussion, in-person meeting is going to be at the Dykeman Houses um, on March 23rd, 6.30 p.m. Um, and it's at 3754 10th Avenue. Uh, uh, community center at the Dykeman Houses. Um, 
One other announcement, maybe there'll be time for this at next month's agenda, um, maybe May. Um, many of you participated in the Highbridge Anchor Parks Master Plan and helped identify forest restoration um, as a high priority there. Highbridge Park is 103 acres. Um, the New York City Parks Department's nonprofit partner, the Natural Areas Conservancy, has just spent an extensive amount of time um, undertaking an, an ecological assessment and developing a forest management plan for the 100 acres of forest and highbridge. Um, this land is essential to the health of Uptown. Um, and Natural Area Conservancy has worked with numerous community stewards. Um, Conectémonos has been involved, Wheels has been involved, um, New York Restoration Project. Um, some of our super stewards uh, from Highbridge, Word Up has come out, um, been a part of it. Um, so we're really excited for them to present their findings and their recommendations and next steps to this committee um, that was really instrumental in helping shape the Highbridge Anchor Parks Master Plan. So if not in April for Earth Day, I guess uh, we'll invite them to come in May, Liz, if that works on your agenda. Yeah, I'd rather do it in May because we tend to have a lot. It's a lot of discussion when we do the enforcement, sanitation, hotspots issues. So I try really hard not to have other things on the agenda unless we've got some like screaming priority of something that's going before the landmarks preservation or, or whatever. So if we can pump that to me, I sure. would appreciate that. Um, and just want to give them kudos. They got a New York State DEC Hudson River Estuary uh, grant for that uh, management plan. So it's uh, very exciting. Um, and if you haven't explored the forest, definitely get involved. It's pretty incredible in Highbridge. Um, I think that's it on announcements. Um, more is on Park's website. Um, if anybody has any questions about the coyotes, um, we are continuing to monitor that. Um, if you uh, go on nyc.gov, you can get tips on how to, to appropriately handle uh, coyotes when you encounter them. Uh, Lily Brown was mentioned, so I won't get into that. Um, the last of the $30 million for Highbridge Park, uh, Anchor Park's investments are coming to a close. Uh, it's the Comfort Station, AKA uh, Bathroom, on Edgecombe Avenue at uh, 165th Street. Um, so we're excited that that's gonna go forward. The Kiskeya Comfort Station at Highbridge Park is gonna be going under construction this spring. Um, someone mentioned Bennett Park. If we get good bids on the um, Central Lawn restoration, um, that's going to be going into construction late uh, spring, early summer. Um, Someone mentioned the um, the recent news on the athletes that died uh, who played in the um, uh, in the toxic artificial turf in the Phillies old stadium. Um, there were players that played in that venue, I believe, from 1970 to early 2000. Um, the technology has advanced. I don't know if you came to any of our public input sessions on Bennett Park with the synthetic turf. Um, expert at parks who leads the turf management crew. What we're using is a tufted nylon. Um, so it's far different than what was used in the um, athletic stadiums. Um, and I can we can go back maybe to the minutes and see if we can't find some of the uh, specifics. And I'll reach out to Ryan Hillert at parks as well if people want specifics on what's going to be utilized at Bennett Park. But it's far different than what was used in the 70s. Um, this committee had also asked about the Gorman Park retaining wall, um, the stabilization work. The contractor was unable to complete the tasks ahead of the contract completion date. Um, so the scoped out work is going to be moved in an upcoming contract. This is part of the city citywide retaining wall contract that Isham Park, Inwood Park, uh, we've got the $1.1 million project going on, uh, planned for J. Hood Wright Park. Um, the community garden by the mansion is included in it. Unfortunately, the, the contractor uh, wasn't able to, as you can imagine, there are mobilization issues for getting into the interior of Gorman, given its steep slope. Um, so the, once the contract is registered, um, 
the registration of funds with OMB and the controller's office work is expected to start at the beginning of the fiscal year in July. Um, and um, it's a, I think it's a three month construction duration. Okay. Oh, and last but not least, uh, Monsignor Kett is on schedule uh, to be complete uh, come July. And I know everyone on this committee was very involved in the, the cutting edge bathroom that we'll have there, um, but that's being done and bid out as part of an architectural contract. So it's going to be, um, it hasn't started yet. So it's gonna be separate and apart from the, uh, from the rest of the playground and the basketball courts. Um, we've got, okay, we've got a question in the chat. Okay, so we've got, we've got folks asking questions about J. Hood Wright. I really want to have a conversation about J. Hood Wright in the agenda item on J. Hood Wright. Um, somebody did ask uh, in the chat, what about having an older kid slash tween? playground in Bennett Park. They are currently destroying the plant life as they do at that age. Can you speak to that briefly? Sure. So um, Bennett Park has not been given capital funding for a uh, for the playground to be overhauled. When we did do the conceptual master plan with the community, um, we identified ways to make that playground bigger and add more amenities to it presumably from by capturing the um, the secondary walkway all around the edge and then maybe taking the playground from 183rd Street, uh, rather all the way from Fort Washington to Pinehurst. Um, so capturing more area and diversifying what's offered in it. Um, it has not received city capital funding, however. Um, so that's not something that's going to be happening imminently. What did get funding, the friends of Bennett Park advocated for was the central lawn uh, to be redesigned and uh, more vegetation added to the park um, and to put in a surface that can handle the heavy level of use that Bennett Park uh, receives. It's a two acre park and it, it's, it kind of acts like a regional park. It gets uh, a lot of use, but um, we'd love to redo the playground and make it a playground for all ages and ability in the future should city capital funding uh, become available. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take, I see one question uh, from Daryl. We're going to take that and then I would like to move the agenda. I would characterize it as one hand, not one question. <laughs> Just so we're clear, I would I would really rather carry. I know what you'd rather. Have, but, um, question, Jen. Uh, you did you just mention uh, before the last question uh, was that about Audubon Park bathroom? Is that the the pilot program? No, Audubon um, Park's bathroom is done and it's been open. I was talking about Monsignor Kett up at uh, oh, okay. the houses. That's how how is the pilot working then? The pilot hasn't ha happened. Uh, it hasn't gone into construction because it's being bid out separately from the playground. I see. Okay. And um, also, I was just wondering what was happening with the new leaf or whatever you call it, concession. Uh, I made an announcement about that earlier. It is on schedule to reopen in June. As? A the Bonifant. The Bonifant. A rest it's a restaurant. It's a full oh, okay. service restaurant as has been discussed in this meeting. Uh, there's lots of, can't believe everything you read on Facebook. Uh, there's lots of stuff on Facebook that's incredibly inaccurate. Oh my God, it's just gonna be an event space. Not true. It is going to be a full service restaurant where folks can also have events as it has been since it stopped being a um, greasy burger bar in the early eighties. So it will be a full service restaurant where you can also do events. Thank you. Liz, can I add or no? We don't have time. Um, if you've got a hair on fire question for Jennifer. The oh, no, it's not. It's not a question. It's just a clarification that the restaurant that will be opening, they were local owners of the restaurant on Cabrini. I forget the name, yep, the Whiskey yep, Pig. Yep. It's, it's just a transfer. 
call the, no, it is not just a transfer. It is a completely different organization. They are the principals. They have other backers. Exactly. Um, That's what I meant. It's it's yeah. locally owned and it's the same owners, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yep. And all of this information and more can be read in the minutes of previous meetings on this subject. And exactly. it's great to be back. I'm new to the committee again. So thank you for your patience. Welcome back, Daryl. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we have, I'm not seeing any more hands on that. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, next up, we have um, the main event for this meeting, which is to talk about a variety of issues in J. Hood Wright Park. Um, I want to uh, thank Councilmember De La Rosa and um, Jennifer Hoppe for bringing this item to my attention. Um, I try as much as I can to be up on all of the issues in all of the parks, but it takes a village. Um, and so I appreciate you guys, um, you ladies, uh, raising this. And I'm really glad that we did not have other stuff um, on the agenda and we're able to devote significant amount of time for this. It is my goal. I said in the agenda that I was uh, allocating 45 to 60 minutes for this. Obviously, if we need to go over, as you've already seen, you know, I try to give people the time they need to uh, say what they have to say. So if we need to go over a little bit, we can totally do that. It is my goal to end this meeting by 8.30 because I think after two hours, people people's attention span and blood sugar just begins to fade. Um, I do want to provide a little bit of background and context because I think there are some folks who are new to the committee and who are new to activism. Um, it's been my experience on the board that people tend to get active when there's something they really care about. And it's usually something that has, um, to use less than genteel language, you know, really pissed them off. So if there's a condition that they see in their parks, on their streets, in their housing, in their kids' school, what have you, they get activated because they're angry, because there's something that is not working for them. And that's great. Not that they're angry and not that there's something that's not working for them, but it's great that people have enough of a sense of ownership that they think like, this is my block, my park, my school, my what have you, and I want to work to make it better to make sure that it is meeting my needs. So that's a good thing. It's always important to know that all of these things exist in a context with other people. It's a big city. We have all of these public spaces with lots of different people using them. And sometimes those uses come into conflict. Sometimes those uses need more money than they actually have. So how do we work together to get the funding? Um, one of the things that I was really surprised to learn when I first found this out when I started um, working with the community board and uh, volunteering with the community board is that the parks department is the only agency that does not have a capital budget. Let me repeat that. The parks department is the only city agency that doesn't have a capital budget. So the parks department does not have the ability to say, oh gee, we need to have this project in this park, whether it's a dog run or you know, fixing Highbridge Park or a new playground, some of the things that we've already heard about here this evening. The parks department does not have the ability as an agency to say, we would like to take some money and fund a capital project to do X. The only way that happens is through public advocacy and then the elected officials for the most part, the city council, but occasionally the borough president is able to kick in some money. And sometimes there are um, sources of funding through the state representatives and in very unusual circumstances, there are certain projects that qualify for federal funding. But for the most part, it's the city council. They have an allocation of funds, which then they can direct to um, projects in their community. So it's in forums like this one that elected officials like this one get to hear people saying, hey, we want to see whatever are the improvements 
um, in, in this case, J. Hood Wright Park. So the other thing that it's important to know is, as you might imagine, the capital funding process is not quick. It's a fairly bureaucratic process. It takes a long time. And part of that is unfortunate, but it substantially makes a lot of sense because these are public dollars and it's appropriate for the public to weigh in on how public dollars are spent. So um, we have these conversations, we uh, figure out what the priorities are, these things get funded um, and the budget cycle sort of works through what it works through. Um, I believe that Jennifer and uh, the councilwoman can address these um, matters more specifically, but I do did want to just provide sort of that bit of context uh, for folks who are new to the committee and have not been to this meeting before. Um, I would also just as a procedural note, like to encourage people to keep it respectful. And uh, for the person who asked in all caps, if I work for the parks department, no, I do not. But thank you for your kind editorial comment. Uh, so without further ado, we have uh, Councilwoman De La Rosa. Thank you, Liz, and thanks um, to all of our neighbors and um, constituents who have come out tonight. This is an important issue for me and an important issue for all of you here, obviously. I want to thank Community Board 12 for their partnership um, and allowing us the forums to have this conversation. I want to just echo some things that um, have been said that we've been working on for uh, the last few months. Uh, so just to put us to center the budget conversations that are happening at the city council, because I know that was mentioned. So usually the preliminary budget from the mayor comes out in at the end of January, beginning of February of each year. And the budget process goes from February, we're now in March, we're having preliminary budget hearings. And then in May, we have the mayor um, releases the executive budget. Then we do executive budget hearings. And then in June of every year, the city council members, like myself, we allocate, we, we complete the process of allocating funding towards projects in our communities. Why is this important and why is this significant? Because up until a budget is adopted, there are only proposals. Once the budget is adopted, that is when projects are funded and they go on to the next phase, which is contracting of those projects. They get, uh, the city agencies get notified and scoping and design of those projects happen. Yes, it is true that they take a long time. We all um, are frustrated by that. Every single day of my life um, is working to expedite and try and move the needle forward on these processes. But as Liz notably mentioned, um, a lot of this is because obviously it is your tax dollars at work and they want to make sure that the money that is being invested in communities is used responsibly, that we're responsibly stewarding the dollars of taxpayers in our city. In this budget fight, um, the New York City budget for this year is $101 billion. Uh, we have about 14% of parkland in all of, of New York City, but only 0.6% of the city budget is allocated towards the parks department. So that is a very small percentage. And as Liz mentioned, um, the parks department is the only city agency that does not have the ability to on their own allocate money for projects. Usually that happens um, through partnerships with council members Sorry to interrupt, but I've got a question in the chat, and I also had a question. Um, how? What, what did you say that budget number was, the whole New York City budget? $101 billion. $101 billion. Thank you. Yes, and the city parks budget is about 0.6% of that, or about, last year was funded at $624 million. And, you know, that is very low. And the parks department does not have the ability to, as you mentioned, Liz, go 101 is the whole budget, yes, to go and allocate capital funds for the needs in communities. So what happens? There's partnerships that happen between council members, the borough president, 
and the parks department. Every year we meet, we talk about the capital needs in our community and through discretionary funds that are allocated to each council member, we're able to decide which projects are priority. I do have to say that we get about five million with an M, million dollars in capital funds, each council member. With those five million dollars, the different agencies that we try to fund include our schools who are in need for repair. So if a school needs an air conditioner, if a school needs an auditorium upgrade, if a school needs um, to have an ADA project happen, we fund those projects through the capital budget. Uh, we have parks projects, obviously, that come in through there. We have uh, DOT projects that come in through uh, the capital projects, and we have library projects that come. Those are the, the big um, buckets of projects that we can fund, and NYCHA. So our uh, NYCHA developments get funding through that budget. So as you could imagine, five million is not a big pot of money for a lot of need in our communities. That is why I support, and we have been working to support the 1% campaign for parks. And the 1% campaign, I don't know if Jen spoke about this in her remarks, I'll be very brief on it, is a fight to increase 1%, um, a 1% increase to maintenance staff and maintenance work and full-time operations of our city parks um, so that they don't have to rely so heavily on outside forces to do the maintenance work in our parks. But that is a budget fight. And when until we're, there is agreement around that with the mayor and the city council, and we pass that in the budget, um, until then, it is just a fight that we are taking on every single day and hoping that as budget neg negotiations conclude, both the city council and the mayor can agree to that type of funding. So with our capital dollars, we uh, do the work of speaking with our stakeholders every single day um, to make sure that we are following up on the needs in our parks. So far, I've held uh, several conversations around J. Hood Wright Park, including conversations with the uh, participants and users of the J. Hood Wright Dog Park, who I met in August, which was outside of the budget process. Um, August, uh, so from August to now, we have just began engaging in this budget process. So I just want to clarify for the time frame. And so we have the J. Hood Wright Dog Park. We've also met with the folks who are organizing and working around the ramps that lead to J. Hood Wright Park. We've heard about concerns with the recreational center um, and other capital needs that exist in J. Hood Wright Park. Um, and so one, I am grateful for the advocacy of all of our colleagues. I think that there are there is some work that has been done, more work that needs to be done in terms of ensuring that J. Hood Wright Park is taken care of. I wanna reiterate my commitment to in this budget funding a project that uh, will make sure, uh, you know, has uh, the hat that makes J. Hood Wright Park a priority. And so I'm here to listen from all of you and talk about how we can partner together to make these things a reality. Um, I also want to say that, you know, I am grateful for the members of the J. Hood Wright Park community that have agreed to get uh, to participate in. Uh, the participatory budgeting process. I know that that is also a long process and can be frustrating, but we're, 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 we are engaged in that process and trying to ensure that J. Hood Wright Park is represented in that process. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about legislation that exists because I know that is a conversation that continues to come up um, about how we move the needle on the bureaucratic delays that, that happen in parks. Um, there's a suite of bills that, exist. Some of those bills have been put in by council member uh, Shaker Krishnan from Jackson Heights. He's the chair of the parks committee and the city council. Um, some of his bills talk about uh, the capital projects process, tracking of the capital projects process, expediting uh, the timeline where capital projects take in order to come to completion. I support that that suite of legislation and we can drop um legislation numbers on the chat there's also a suite of bills that have to do with um dog runs so uh, council member lincoln wrestler has put together um uh, a bill for that talks to the creation of a plan to develop more dog parks for example in our in our local parks and put them under the jurisdiction of the Department of Parks and Recreation. That is a bill that has been introduced. It must go through the legislative process, but um, it, it is it has been introduced and I, and I sponsored it. 
There's another bill that talks about the maintenance and cleaning of dog parks that um, to come under the jurisdiction of the Department of Parks and Recreation. Again, this has a budget implication. So we need to make sure that as a city, we're prioritizing the funding for this mate for the maintenance and support staff in the dog runs. I also sponsored that bill. And just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I put in legislation so that um, you know, when you call 311, now you have the option of um being categorizing your complaint in relation to a dog run because I heard from some of the neighbors that they were frustrated by the process that currently exists when it comes to calling 311. I believe that this is an important accountability tool. Every time you call 311, there is a complaint number that is created, a unique complaint number, and the agencies are responsible for coming in and closing those complaints. And it's important for us as your council members to have those complaint numbers, one, because there are power in numbers in terms of advocating for our parks, but also too, we can follow up and make sure that the agencies can track the complaints and that the complaints are being um, closed on time. And so, you know, I walk the district, um, talk to neighbors all over the district, and there are many of our parks that need uh, capital improvements, including in Woodhill Park, that has outstanding projects like the Nature Center that we were still waiting to reopen, Amelia Gorman Park, which is another park that I'm often asked about. I get asked about the, um, the basketball courts throughout the district. People want to refurbish the basketball courts in different places. And so we're working every day to try and see how we can increase our capacity for funding these projects. Um, as far as Jehud Bright Park, I've given my commitment publicly, privately, um, in the meetings that we've had, to making sure and ensuring that we can fund projects like the renovation of the dog run. While I understand that there has been frustration around the delays, I want to reiterate um, my commitment, not only to the dog run, but to the entirety of the J. Hood Wright Park and the J. Hood Wright Park community. I've come out on several occasions, including we had a, a emergency services uh, training at that park with the FDNY and members of the Red Cross. We came out and participated with the group that does the cleanups of the ramp, who's doing an amazing job to make sure that we are able to, um, you know, clean up and have accessibility to the ramps. Uh, I've walked the parks with the parks department. And so my commitment is and continues to be um, to listen to your voices and bring solutions to the problems that you all have brought forth. Um, I see here in the chat that someone says, 311 doesn't care about us. 311 is not a person. Your council member cares about you. 311 is a tool for accountability and follow-up. And you can believe that we will make sure that if you put in a 311 complaint and we have access to it and there's an agency that's on the other end of that line, we will be following up with that, with that agency. Um, I wanna thank once again, Jen and Liz and everybody else for allowing us the opportunity. My staff is also on this call. We're taking notes. Liz, I don't know if, if there's questions for me or there's another portion for that. Um, um, I leave that to you, I'm Madam quite, Chair. I'm quite sure there are questions for you. Okay. I see a couple of hands up. And before I get to Jen, I just want to address sort of a quick procedural issue. Um, so something everyone should know about the chat and the Q&A. Not everybody can see the chat and not everybody can see the Q&A. And according to the New York State Open Meetings Law, everything has to be public. So one of the things that I'll do, and you can see I look distracted. It's not that I'm distracted, it's that I'm reading uh, the chat. There are a bunch of questions in the chat. Some of them I've answered. Many of them I have not because they have to be answered aloud recorded so that everybody can hear it. So if I have not answered your question in the chat or it has not been specifically addressed, it's not that anybody is ignoring you, it's that I'm trying to group it together and we'll answer them in their course. Um, this, is the, this is one of the downsides of Zoom. You know, you could sort of see me acknowledging you and your question if we were in a room and we could actually see each other. So I apologize for that. I apologize for the kind of stilted format um, that uh, gets imposed by Zoom, but I will do my very best to make sure that everybody's questions are answered and that folks who want to talk get a chance to do that. And before I recognize Jennifer and then um, some hands up in the in the attendees. Um, I want to just address something that's come up in the chat by uh, in the Q&A 
by several people about why does Fort Tryon Park uh, get more, more funding and why does the funding from the Fort Tryon Park Trust benefit the Fort Tryon Park Trust and is there a conflict of interest and is uh, the Fort P Tryon Park Trust getting grant money from the Parks Department directed to it because a Parks Department employee also is the director of the Fort Tryon Park Trust. So these are some the, of the that have shown up in the chat. Hold on a second. I'm going to address some of that. Yeah, before you answer that, though, yeah. Liz, I, I have to have a point of order. Um, it's also with the with the open meetings laws, people, if we are addressing uh, chats or questions or whatever, they have to uh, have their name. They cannot be anonymous. I know we've dealt with this issue in the past. So any anything that comes from an anonymous thing, if they'd like to put their name in, they can, but they can it cannot be addressed simply um, with an anon anonymous. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so the Fort Tryon Park Trust is a conservancy. Um, donors donate money to the Fort Tryon Park Trust, and the mission of the Fort Tryon Park Trust, as I understand it. Um, as a donor myself, is to support Fort Tryon Park. So most of the money for from the Fort Tryon Park Trust goes to Fort Tryon Park. However, um, some of the funds from uh, the Fort Tryon Park Trust, and Jennifer can address this better than I can, um, has gone to support other parks in the neighborhood as well. The Parks Department does not give grants to the Fort Tryon Park Trust. The Parks Department administers capital projects that are funded by, primarily by, as I said before, the council member, but to some extent, the borough president, um, other elected officials in Fort Tryon Park, Bennett Park, J. Hood Wright Park, Highbridge Park, Inwood Hill Park, Isham Park, many, many, many parks. Um, but there isn't a relationship of the Fort Tryon Park Trust getting money from the Parks Department. Um, I see that I'm gonna recognize Jennifer and then the councilwoman, and then I'm gonna do a lap through the attendees because we've got lots of folks with their hands up. Um, I just, uh, thank you, Liz, and I can add to that, but I just wanna let people know about some of the capital projects that have happened in J. Hood Wright Park, uh, which might help amplify the picture of of investments that have been taking place there. Um, we did do a capital overhaul in 2012 with the community, which included the create the formalization of the dog run, the new um, safety surface, changing the hydrology of the, the park's landscape. I believe that was $1.75 million. And then um, another capital improvement that's been done is the adult workout area, which the community um, advocated through uh, for through participatory budget process and the council allocated funding for that. Um, this committee has seen uh, there's a $1.1 million capital city capital project, um, part of the retaining wall, citywide retaining wall contract uh, that the city allocates for repairing. And I think Diego, you put this uh, in, in the chat. Um, there's a retaining wall at the north end of J. Hood Wright Park that supports the handball courts. It's adjacent to the soccer pitch and it holds up Pinehurst Avenue. Um, we've had private engineers have been um, procured through the city's procurement process for the Parks Department. Uh, design has come to this committee and that work is uh, going to be part of the next round of construction of retaining walls that Gorman Park uh, is going to be in. And then as part of the state of good repair um, allocation, the roof of the recreation center will be uh, reconstructed, the historic roof. Um, there had been one prior capital project uh, a, a few years ago where the cupola was restored um, uh, as a sort of a first phase. Um, and then the Parks Department also does leverage private funds, that, as many of you know, from the soccer pitch that was funded through the Mayor's Fund and through Adidas and Edidad. Um, so that's another uh, improvement that's been made. 
Um, and now the council member has graciously been talking to dog run owners about a participatory budget item for the dog run. Um, so J Hood Wright Park is a park that's uh, a high priority for the parks department. We constantly look for ways to um, fix uh, its infrastructure, um, leverage new resources through our partnerships for parks. Uh, Friends of J Hood Wright has received several grants. We built the Native Garden. Um, we got a, a, a foundation grant for a lot of those plants for the extensive native garden there, job boxes, things along those lines, the City Parks Foundation has funded. Um, so it's from the for the past uh, decade plus, we've been working to leverage more resources for that site, um, even though our elected officials have been extremely generous in providing funding for it. Um, in terms of the Fort Tryon Park Trust, as Liz said, it doesn't receive grants from the Parks Department. It actually raises private funds to supplement what the Parks Department is able to do. So the $100,000 stabilization project in the dog run there was entirely privately funded. Um, in terms of conflict of interest, in many um, situations where you have a park administrator, um, they're also tasked with collaborating with the nonprofit partner. Um, and that partnership is evaluated by the city's conflict of interest board, um, usually on a, a regular basis. So similarly, the Riverside Park administrator has a role with the Riverside Park Conservancy. Um, there's a Cortona Park administrator. Um, the Madison, there's a Madison Square Park administrator. There are lots of administrators that have that dual role. Um, so it's not uh, unique. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. And then I I, I do want to address Amanda. Uh, Amanda um, raised. Amanda um, got injured uh, when a dog oh, not I I'd, I'd really so okay. the way that I'd like to run this meeting is I love that people have questions in the chat and I keep on trying to answer oh. people's questions in the chat by saying please use the raise hand feature so that you can ask your question. Everybody has the ability to use the raise hand. You'll see it in the bottom of the bar. There's a little hand thing. It looks like this. Actually, it looks like this. Um, you press on that. See, you'll see a little raised hand. And that's how I know your hand is raised. And Zoom does a really great job of putting people's names in the order in which they raise their hands. So if you have questions, use the raise hand feature. Um, uh, Carmen, and then actually, yeah. Carmen, I, I know that you, unless you've got like a burning clarification. Yes, I, 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 I really, okay. I have just, it's, I'll be two seconds. So mm -hmm. the question was asked about why the $300, $300,000 was given to the Fort Washington, the Fort Tryon dog run and not to J Hood Wright. So I just want to clarify that I was made aware, I came into the city council in 2021, January, 2021. I was made aware of the issues at the J Hood Wright dog run after the first budget cycle had closed. So I had no mechanism of reopening that cycle in order to fund the project. The Fort, the Fort uh, Tryon dog run up and the folks there had approached me within that budget process timeline and asked, for consideration for an allocation for water service at the Fort Tryon Dog Run, which will serve the entire community that uses the park in an effort to uh, bring water service to that part of the park. So I just want to clarify because there have been um, some questions about why this park and not that park. Every budget cycle, we get hundreds of requests from different entities, including all of our schools. We evaluate the request and we try as much as possible to put some money down towards those projects. The $300,000 that were given to um, the Fort Tryon of a dog run park project, for example, was a drop in the bucket in comparison to the, uh, the, um, the cost of that project, which was in the millions of dollars. So yes, I was elected in 2021. The first budget we passed was in 2022. And we are now going into the second budget cycle. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Okay, so now, uh, first up, uh, Wanda, 
no last name listed. If you wouldn't mind giving me your last name for the um, minutes. Wanda, you can unmute. Going to give it another couple of seconds. OK, might be Wanda went, stepped out of the room. So I will call on her again. Uh, next up, Diana Douglas. If you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> OK, um, dog run is a, is one aspect of uh, Jayhood Wright Park. Um, <clears throat> Tony Speranza, who really spearheaded the last uh, the major improvements, including water, which I, I don't have the, the numbers, but to bring water from the street was a big, it took 20 years to do that or more, just to do that. <laughs> um, We, Friends of Jayhood Wright Park has taken advantage of partnerships for parks because when they offer uh, matching grants, which we had for the Native Plant Garden, um, um, a grant we partnership that was IOB, so that was a matching grant. We raised twenty five hundred, and IOB gave twenty five hundred. Um, <clears throat> the dog run, um, we had a grant from the neighborhood fund. They, are, they only come to $1,500. Again, you have to apply for them. Uh, and it behooves the, the participants to apply. Um, Tony Speranza did help with the maintenance of the dog run and partnered with the local um, pet shops to have uh, Saturday or Sunday morning uh, coffee and donuts and and get some donations from them. It's it's really a partnership that we're working with when we work with parks, and and with the city council person. Um, I think that's a. And I haven't seen any maintenance being done since Tony died uh, in 2021, and then we had the pandemic, and I think that that there's been. Um, so there was not a continuity of participation. And that is, has been bothering me for since I'm seeing that there hasn't been that kind of participation. And I'm glad to see people are reaching out, but we need to reach out in partnership. Uh, the, the new job box is because I applied for a grant from partnerships and for the Haven Avenue project so that we're all working together, that we are not separate entities, but a partnership of people who are working to, in, or volunteering, I should say, which is a form of philanthropy when you think about it, to improve our, not only the park, but the environment around the park. I rest. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, next up, we've got Wanda, who I think is back in the meeting. So let's, uh, if you wanna unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just like to know. Uh, my dog visits J Hood. That's where his playground. And I would like to know: will we will we be getting any funding to help better the park because the gravel is horrendous? I love a good short question. Um, I think Councilwoman, you want to field that? Yes, I I've, I've committed. We we did just uh, add additional uh, gravel to the dog run. But the I, gravel, the amount of gravel that we got, it was like a little corner. It wasn't even, it didn't, it didn't help. It didn't do anything. Usually at most runs, the, the dog run group helped raises funds for gravel um, and then helps the parks department spread it. Um, we were able within parks to, to have two pallets delivered um, and we can continue to partner with the community on getting more. Uh, while we wait for the capital renovation. Yes. Yeah. So um, I just we'll want to add 
Okay. Oops. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, Wanda. Go ahead. Will Finish. we be getting more gravel to cover the whole area? Because the gravel that we have now, when the dogs run, the, the, the park is just filled with dust. It's flying in our hair and our face, and some people are breaking out with rashes. It's just, it's horrible. What most runs do is, and I know in the winter we don't have water because we winterize so that the pipes don't burst, but at most runs, uh, the volunteers will water down the gravel to help minimize dust. So at Washington Square Park, at Tompkins Square Park, um, Riverside Park, um, you've got uh, groups that, that are, the, the dog owners themselves are helping in the ongoing stewardship of the run. So do you see, do you foresee any um, upgrade to J-Hood? Absolutely. I, I can speak to that if, if, if you all don't mind. So um, we have been working with Spencer, um, who you all know, um, who has gracefully um, entered the participatory budgeting process that our, that our uh, office is heading through the city council. Um, I'm happy to report that we are in the ballot design phase of participatory budgeting. So within the $5 million that we get for capital funding, $1 million is set aside for, cap for participatory budgeting projects. The a ballot is developed and the community gets to vote on the different projects adding up to $1 million. Um, Spencer, who you all know, has been part of that, um, dele of that dele uh, delegate for your community, your section of the community, he volunteered. We thank him for joining. And the dog run project will be on that ballot, who, which you will get to vote on um, for $500,000. And so that amount of money is going to be on the PB ballot. If the project wins PB, it will get the $500,000. If the budget does not win, if the if the project does not win, I am committed within my resources because I, I want to be very truthful to you all. It's $5 million to cover the entire district um, within my resources to allocate funding to redo the dog park. But I do want to know, I do want you to know that a capital allocation equals us having the understanding that a capital project process will mean that there will be an amount of time that is dedicated to, first of all, the, the, the money won't be allocated until June, right? June 2020. Right. Then uh -huh. there will be a process for design and scoping that involves public comment on the project. So a, a final project will not be put forward without a process for community input. And then after that is construction. And during construction time, there also won't be access to the dog run. So I want to be truthful about this being a process that is not the easiest process, but that one that I am committed to, to ensuring that one is streamlined, that two, your voices are, are in that process, and three, that the funding is there. So I, I've already said multiple times on this call that we get hundreds of capital budget requests. I think that emphasizing and reemphasizing to you all tonight that my commitment since August when I met with y'all has been that we will put money and we will allocate capital dollars towards the renovation of the dog room. Cool, thank you. All right, I wanna, in an effort to get as many people's questions in, um, I, I appreciate both of your answers, but uh, if you could just a little bit more concise, that would be great. Uh, I appreciate, this is Wanda, I appreciate having the floor and just one, Quick question. Uh, nope, nope, nope. You're gonna have okay. to re-raise re your hand and go. To I respect the that. I respect thank that. You, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your understanding. Um, next up, we've got uh, Amanda Bastion. I invite you to unmute. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I was injured in the park on December 26th. Uh, it was a pretty serious injury. Could have been a lot worse if I were, honestly, if I were a little closer to that cement slab it could have it, it basically just um scalped me up, up to the skull and so it's a, it, it's a dangerous situation i want to know one how how can i be reimbursed for my medical bills and what is going to be done i was told after i um reported the incident i was told that things would be expedited and that doesn't seem to have happened um i'll take that thank you Amanda, I'm, I'm so sorry uh, that you got injured. That's terrible. Um, 
and uh, understand a, a dog knocked you down, um, and that's frightening and terrorizing. And, and well, a, a dog knocked me down, and I, I hit because the um, the gravel had been um, it, it was no longer level; it had been eroded, and that's the reason that I was hurt, not right. because of the dog. It was right. because of these the how sure. the park is not ignored for ten years. We understand. So we we um, brought in gravel to ensure that the reveal of the concrete slab was minimized. Um, and we were going through the regular PO process and it was expedited and the, the staff uh, laid that gravel out. I don't know if you've been back since. Um, we absolutely want you to get reimbursed. Um, the process is you would file a claim at the controller's office. I can put it in the chat if I'm allowed, uh, Liz. Can I be enabled to do that? Uh, in, the web, in the web? Yeah, you can put if you're able. I don't really understand. Jennifer, you, you have my email. You can email me the information as well. Because yeah. I emailed you directly. You did. Okay. I can send it to you via email and I'll put it in here as well. Yeah, I think there's there's a uh, she did ask a question in the Q and A, so you can uh, reply to that question. It uh, it's not in the, it's in the answered Q and A. Uh, it's in the answered questions. Um, I answered it to say please raise your hand to ask that question. So if you could reply there with the with the link, uh, would be great. And and also my condolences on your injury. That sounds just awful. Um, Spencer, and please tell me if I pronounced your last name correctly. It's Badesh? Yeah, that's pretty good, actually. Um, <laughs> most people don't get it right. <laughs> good job. Um, so a couple things, um, and then maybe I'll ask all my questions, and then you can answer them. OK. So first, you know, I've been going through the, particip the participatory budgeting process, and I was told very explicitly by Jennifer um, in one of those meetings that gravel was not eligible for a capital improvement and that it was not eligible, therefore, for the participatory budgeting process. So my no, concern just to clarify, just to clarify, gravel itself is not capitally eligible. That's something that we're doing through parks expense funds or we can do through an IOB grant or something. That's something that because it doesn't last, you know, uh, doesn't right. have a capital yeah. last span of five years. It's an expense item. But when you redo a run, um, do you mind? Do you mind if I finish my questions? Just because yeah, I, 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 I just wanted to clarify that it, gravel is not capitally Jennifer, eligible. But if you redo a run through participatory budget, you would get all new gravel as part of that. Okay, so we'll hold you to that. Um, and then I'm just a little con like confused of what exactly the goal of this meeting is. Um, it sounds like you guys are just telling us it's going to be a lot more time. Um, and a lot of this are these are things that we've already raised. And so that's I guess that's more of a statement. And then lastly, I do want to dispel the this like idea that the community is not doing enough to help. And I've talked about this with Diane at length. We talked about this as a community when you guys were at the um, the park last August. Um, we all could go out every single day and spend, you know, 12 hours a day raking the gravel. There is not enough gravel. So, um, and we do community cleanups. We, we even beyond the dog park, we pick up trash. I've done um, pick cleanups with friends of Fort Tryon Park. So we do do that. Um, and I just wish you guys would stop saying that because I like, while I'm not saying it's black and white that it's 100% the park or 100% the community, honestly, like I know it's not your attention, but it feels a little like gaslighting us, like we're not doing enough or it's somehow our fault that the parks is not investing in our parks. And so there is clearly a limit to how much we can do, even with the retaining wall that you guys have put into the dog run, there's really no gravel left to retain. So like we need the city to replenish the gravel and then we can talk about maybe we go out once a month, once a week, whatever, to, to rake it. And even the new gravel that's been put in has started blowing in the opposite direction towards the benches and out the other way. And so I also just wonder, if, one, if it was put in correctly, and two, if that's even the right solution. So like, are we just going in circles and then it's gonna be somehow our fault because the gravel goes back out? Um, I'd like to actually address that very briefly and then uh, get to some of the other questions. Um, 
I do think that part of the issue is typically dog run uh, dogs, dog, dog owner groups do do some fundraising for the upkeep of their dog runs. So there is some financial contribution of the people who are using the dog run who um, help to contribute financially to the dog runs upkeep. So I, so, I mean, we, we, hold on, we, hold on. So we, that, we, hold on. So I think that, you're mischaracterizing what I'm saying. Right, so let me finish. So while it is true that there hasn't been that financial contribution from a dog owners group at J Hood Wright Park, as opposed to say, for example, Fort Tryon or some of the other Rockies up in Inwood Hill Park. I am very sorry for anything that I might have, I mean, I can speak only for myself, but I certainly apologize for anything that I either said or failed to say that suggests in any way that the dog owners or any other users in the park, A, don't care about the park, y'all clearly do, and B, aren't working for the betterment of the park, you clearly are. So I, I hear you on that front and I apologize for anything that I, that I may have said or failed to say that gave that impression uh, that that was the, the opinion of this committee because it is not. Um, I do, you know, mindful of time, I do want to get to some of the other um, can, questions. Can I, can, I, can I just say? Actually, no, um, because I would really like to get, to, I've got one, I've got like eight more hands raised and I encourage you to raise your hand again for another turn to ask a question. Um, with that, Rachel Richardson. Hi, um, this is Rachel. And um, thank you for um, allowing us to be at this meeting. Um, I live across the street from the dog run and um, I love my neighborhood, love the park. You know, really it's a great community and the dog run is a big asset to the park in general because it's very well attended. People go there at night, it's well lit. You know, it's, it makes the park feel a lot safer um, in the area to have people around. Um, I just wanted to voice, uh, I know it's kind of been said, but I just wanted everyone to be aware that there, you know, Amanda's injury was certainly the absolute worst, um, but dogs have gotten sick and injured from the dust and my dog gets lung infections and can't go and I use an inhaler after being there and I remember you know, being with Carmen De La Rosa and Jennifer, um, you know, and we were all covered in dust at that August meeting. And we are certainly willing to put in whatever work and I'm willing to donate. Um, we just really need a safe and sanitary run. And, um, you know, it's, it's upsetting that dogs have gotten broken legs, broken toes, um, you know, that Amanda got staples the back of her head. I mean, you know, people are breaking out in rashes, dogs get UTIs. I mean, it just is really um, kind of a disgusting environment and um, we want it to just be a wonderful environment. And we wanted to thank you for, especially Councilwoman De La Rosa for, you know, being open to our concerns and trying to work with us. You let us know, you know, I don't know that we're going to get um, the funding. I know, um, you know, that Spencer's trying for it, but we're certainly willing to put in the work, the funding and anything we can do. Um, and we are willing participants and we appreciate um, our park and our run so, so, so much. And my dog needs it and misses it and can't really go. Um, which is part of the reason we moved across the street, but um, which is ironic, but um, so thank you very much. And with that, that's all I'm gonna say. Okay, thank you. Um, Elizabeth Starchevit. I wanna thank everyone for uh, bringing up this topic of our park, I, it does seem sometimes that uh, the park gets a little less attention. Certainly uh, my, the, the dog you, uh, run users have given it a lot of attention this evening. 
I'd like to ask about, Jennifer mentioned earlier something about um, retaining walls. And uh, the terrace of, of J. Hood Wright has several areas that are small that where the bricks are uh, dislodged and that I'm wondering whether small projects like that have to go through the entire city process in order to have somebody come and give it some physical attention. The other, the other um, area that uh, also needs a little bit more attention are the stairs, the wide stairs that are at, that come directly past the ramp that where you come in on 170, um, 176th Street, and the the stairs that go up, which have a wonderful, wonderful tree uh, uh, near it. Uh, also are starting to fall apart. And, and once again, they too need some uh, physical attention. So I think besides having taken part in many, many cleanups, which I think we need more of in the park and not just on the ramp, which is a wonderful place to clean up, but the park itself needs a little bit more of a cleanup time. Um, I also would like to say that I don't think the neighborhood gets to know enough about the activities by only going online and, and slash gov slash park. I think there has to be a little bit more physical visibility in signs uh, uh, on the poster board in near the playground, et cetera, so that people come by both in Spanish and English and people come by and, and get to see what could be going on. And I wanna thank you all for bringing up the topic. I wanna thank uh, everyone who's passionately involved in the topic. I, having grown up in that park, am also passionately involved in it. So thanks a lot. Um, Jen, thank you, rather than, um, can you just um, state very briefly if this retaining wall contract would if this retaining wall work could be folded into the existing retaining wall contracts or that are no. already happening or if this would have to be a different project so elizabeth we can send our masons to look at it uh it's really a, a, a question of degree so the citywide retaining wall is an outcome of the city's office of management and budget sending out inspectors for all of the significant retaining walls in the city and they prioritize which ones or to get city funding um, based on condition uh, and, and level of deterioration. And that's why the Pinehurst area was prioritized. But um, I can email you and um, maybe we can meet out on site and then I can get the, we can put work requests into the Masons to see if they can't touch up uh, the retaining wall. And we're Thank all- you. We're all for more um, park cleanups. The Friends of Jay Hood Wright do an amazing job on the ramp and in the gardens. Um, so we can talk about that offline as well. Yes, with, with pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I, I'm trying to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, Brian Chang. Hi, yes, thank you for the time here. I'm also a fellow denizen of Washington Heights and a frequent um, user of the dog run and the park in general. Um, this kind of goes back a little bit to um, kind of what um, I think Elizabeth mentioned a, a bit earlier as well. Um, and this was kind of also mentioned by Jennifer and, and Councilwoman Carmen uh, De La Rosa during our meetup last year in that, you know, there is a process that we also have to go through if we wanted to raise our own funds, because I think if we put our heads to it, we could raise our own funds, but, you know, why is there all why are there all these hurdles for us to improve the dog run if we can raise our own funds partially we were also told that you know we need to have a nonprofit like a friends of park right organization to apply for grants and whatnot um and i know diana is a head of um friends of j hood right park and diana as you mentioned the dog run is a part of the park so it feels like the dog run is left behind although it's supposed to be a part of the park and so, you know, we brought up the idea of like, can we create our own nonprofit for the dog run and also, you know, work together with friends? And we were told that it wasn't necessary, but, you know, I just wonder if there is a, a bigger solution to this because it seems like the nice parks in the city are getting nicer and a lot of 
our parks and our areas are being left behind. Okay. Valid, absolutely valid point. I'm um, sure Jay Hood Wright, um, friends of Jay Hood Wright would be happy to work with you, Brian, on a grant for the dog run for gravel or for whatever. Um, and I can connect you to Diana Douglas offline. And I'd be happy to facilitate that. Thank you. Thank um, you. Alexis Ari Gemma, I'm sorry. I hope I was close. Yeah, you got it right. Great job, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this meeting. Hello, Elizabeth, and hello, Jennifer. Um, thanks for everything you do for parks. Um, also, thanks to Carmen De La Rosa for this meeting. Um, I, I'm Alexis Arjama, and I'm with Friends of Jay Hood Wright Park. Um, for those who might be unfamiliar, like we're a group that's been around for about 30 years. Diana Douglas, um, who spoke earlier, has been a big uh, leader in the group. Um, through her mentorship, I've been leading the Haven Ramp cleanup the past two years. Um, and in the past two years, um, we actually have had over 900 volunteer hours uh, go towards the Haven Ramp, as well as It's My Park Days in J. Hood Wright Park. Um, we've removed close to 600 bags of trash. Um, and it's awesome. And it shows just the invested interest of the community in the Haven Ramp area, um, as well as in our park in general. Um, happy to do uh, events, you know, with, in partnership also with the dog people, uh, uh, the dog park <laughs> group. Um, although I know, uh, I don't, I know we've connected a bunch, but we haven't been able to like uh, hold an event yet. Um, but, you know, anyway, I wanted to just, uh, my question, and, and it was basically, I wanted to ask about any updates regarding some of the ma major safety issues that we've uh, had brought up in the past year regarding, you know, the sinkhole, as well as the lights in the tunnel. Um, and just the last thing I really quick just and then I won't speak again. Um, I'll let you guys take it away. Um, after we hear the safety updates, I also just want to say I'm unfortunately leaving um, New York City after 10 wonderful years in Washington Heights. And so uh, if anybody's interested in leading the Haven ramp cleanup after I leave or um, any event, you know, hooking up with Diana, as well as one of our other leaders, Daryl, um, you know, they'll mentor you the same way they mentored me. And as long as you like, you know, take initiative and run with it, you'll be great. So you can email friends of J hood, right park at gmail.com friends of J hood, right park at gmail.com. If you're interested in running events, or if you just want to be added to the listserv and be updated on when there will be events, uh, that the group holds. Um, so yeah, Thank you so much. And Jennifer, yeah, I would love to just hear any updates you have. And, sure. And thank, um, you for, thank you for your work. Oh, Absolutely. thank you. It's been yeah. a powerhouse, Alexis. Thank you. Um, we did uh, convene uh, the community board um, and uh, Port Authority in New York, New Jersey, the Parks Department and City DOT um, did an inspection of the Haven Avenue ramp. Alexis, your group had highlighted some of this falling concrete on the columns that support the various highway approach ramps. Um, both DOT and the Port Authority have confirmed that they do regular column inspections. There are no immediate action items. Uh, everything is stable and secure, uh, which is great, which means the area won't get torn up or closed down for construction staging. Um, so Parks is going to try to get in there and put the coping stones back on. We've been working on the railing, re uh, removing sections that are unsound, um, and we're trying to find a solution for getting in a, a bobcat or um, sort of a small utility vehicle uh, for repairing the sinkhole. I guess, could you, uh, like a time... Uh, uh, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, did I miss like a timeline estimate? We, we just had the site visit last week and got verification from Port Authority and City DOT. So I would say, you know, we're aiming for the beginning of summer to have the, we're, we've been ongoing with the railing in the past two weeks. Um, and then it's a question of when we can get our borough crews. You know, they have other jobs that they're doing in the borough to come over uh, with a bobcat for the coping stones and for the uh, the sinkhole. But our goal, our goal is by summer. Thank you, you know, yeah. I appreciate it. And so does everybody who would use the ramp. Um, 
Thank and you. I can follow up about, um, you know, lights and stuff as well. Yes. So thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sharon Limpert. Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, I just had a quick question. It sounds like um, we are putting being put on the spot to fund our own dog park. Um, and what I don't understand is that it doesn't seem like you're asking community members who you who have children who use the playground to do the same. Um, you would ask anybody of anyone who attends the dog park, we take our dog regularly up to two to three times a day sometimes. Um, and everyone who goes to that dog park loves their dog with a passion and would consider their dog a part of their family. So in, in an arise of couples who are choosing not to have children or delaying parenthood till later in life, these, these animals aren't just animals to us. They're our family members and our dog, we've had to, um, she loves the dog park, like loves being there. Everybody knows her because she barks all the time and she has a very distinctive bark. And we've had to like take her away from the dog park multiple times because of skin issues that have come up That's from the gravel, um, from her getting giardia, from like the unsanitary, like the unsanitary conditions that the stagnant gravel, waters. the stagnant water at the dog park that because there's no drainage, the water just pools and then sits on the gravel liner, sits on the gravel liner and then that's a, a hotbed for any kind of waterborne parasite, parasite. Infestation, mosquitoes all uh, those we're doing, excuse me we're doing one person talking at once please we're, and right it's, now it's sharon who has the floor we're, we're, we're a couple, couple. It's, okay. it's we're viewing together my uh, bad sorry so we we just like it sounds like we're, I, I appreciate the councilwoman's um, initiative for legislation that's coming up. Um, but again, we, we just feel like we're being asked to fund our own project for animals that are our children, basically. Um, I never thought I'd be the kind of person to say that, but that's like the health and safety of our dog. Like we have to, every time she gets Giardia, we have to take her to the vet. So it's, it's, it's and this is an ongoing problem. And the gravel is hard on their paws. There's just a lot of issues with the gravel itself as a safety measure that I think our community would love to have addressed. Thank you, uh, Sharon. We agree. Um, when we first did the run, um, we had let the dog run group know at the time that um, gravel wasn't something that we readily had on hand like wood chips um, and that they would need to partner with us for its ongoing restoration. Um, cause, so it's not, it, it's not a question of, you know, we, we don't want the run to be improved. We do, uh, you know, we went out on site. We're, we're trying to figure out if resurfacing is the ultimate goal, um, or if ongoing gravel restoration is, uh, what we need to do in the short term until the capital project happens. The other option that we've put out is, can we raise private funds to bring in a private contractor similar to what's done at Washington Square Park, um, at Riverside Park, um, with the, the dog run associations there, um, so that we don't have to wait the full four years for a city funded capital project. Um, so we're not asking you to maintain the run, we're asking you to help with us. Historically, dog runs have been set up or were created only when there was a dedicated stewardship group for them. So that was sort of, that was the paradigm for how dog runs came to be. So there's always been that expectation that the dog owners would help steward, um, raise funds, maintain that type of thing. Um, um, so- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, I thought you were done. Um, I don't wanna interrupt you if you're not done, but I do wanna, get to more people with raised hands. So I'm gonna respectfully ask um, Carmen if you could hold your, your comment because we still have uh, six people who haven't asked questions yet. I don't want to comment yours. Um, I've got several people named Leslie Atkinson, one, uh, two of whom have their hands raised. So Leslie Atkinson, who I've just asked to unmute, could you please state your name?
Uh, I just got a prompt to unmute. My name yes. is not Lily Atkinson. Okay. And what is your name? Andrew Hartman. Okay. You probably got the link from Leslie Atkinson. And this is why, why I ask people to change their names. Okay. So you're Andrew, say again. Andrew Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N. I apologize. No your worries. instructions to change your name was not an option, perhaps because I'm doing this from my phone. Got it. Okie dokie. Well, Andrew Hartman, who is not Leslie Atkinson, what you got for us? Um, I want to thank you all for the venue uh, for us to speak. Um, you are correct when you said in the beginning of this meeting how, you know, our attention comes to matters like these when there's something that we're passionate about and then we, you know, want to activate ourselves and get involved. If I understand what's been said so far about the budgetary avenues in which we can proceed with repairs, there's uh, the main, you know, budget that goes to the mayor that is uh, happens in June. There's the participatory participatory budget, which is five hundred thousand, uh, which is a part of a million, which is a part of five million. If I understood that correctly, um, there's private funding. Uh, so my I have a question in two parts, separate from those three avenues. If I understood those avenues correctly. Is there any sort of emergency funding that we could go to that would provide band-aids until we are able to do a, a fuller renovation? I, I know that, you know, we did recently have that one uh, pallet of gravel. We have discussed already how, you know, that wasn't enough. Um, but if there's any sort of emergency funding so we can get a little bit more of a band-aid for the park so it can be enjoyed until these much lengthier processes um, happen if we are able to get that funded. And then separately from that, with those different avenues that were discussed, whichever one of them is successful, I'm curious to know the timeline in terms of implementing them. Because even if something has to go to a vote, what hasn't what I haven't heard yet is when does the vote happen? Is the vote part of the September or, or excuse me, the November voting? And then once the vote happens and it goes to contractors, what is the contractor process length? I'm just trying to get a realistic timeline of when we can see real improvements in the parks rather than, you know, I appreciate the, you know, the little efforts that have been done here and there. Obviously, it's not enough, but I'm just curious so I can get more better expectation of when things are really going to improve there. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, that's that's a, a question both for Jennifer and for the councilwoman. So if you can sure. briefly address that, please. So short term, if, if peop it's peop people seem to want more gravel because it's migrating, it's got to be raked more. We've got the drainage issues. We could either use a private grant for, for procuring more um, with with friends of J. Hood Wright Park, or I can go back and see if parks can't um, allocate uh, any additional expense funding to it. And that's something that would happen in say the next, you know, two, three months. The intermediate is the option is if there's a private uh, funding source, um, either you know crowdfunding or a foundation grant, something like that. You could bring in a private contractor to, to do, um, like Washington Square Park does, Riverside Park, bring in a private contractor to treat the uh, stone screenings and you know uh, do some leveling and then replace all of them. Uh, I think they do it on every other year at those runs. Um, and that, it, that would need to be privately funded. So once the funding was in hand and the contractor got you know, permits for construction access, it could be done rather quickly. And then the capital project process through the city's procurement and the public input is a four-year process once funding has been uh, committed. I don't know if that answers it enough. Uh, Councilwoman, you got and something? put a link in the, in the chat too. Um, I don't have much, just a reminder that the budget process within participatory budgeting is all contained in the process that passes at the end of June, beginning of July. So that's the time frame for the entire thing for the allocation of the funds before we get to the part that Jen just described. 
Okay. So the participatory um, thing in June is a part of the capital funding that takes four years? So all of the budget in that is contained in the city all passes at once in June. So the allocation of the funds. So when we make the decision of 1 million is going here, 500,000 is going here, all of that happens in the June budget at the end of June. Participatory budgeting is part of that process too. So the money to fund the project that wins the participatory budgeting process is contained within that larger budget, if that makes sense. I see. So, so that is also uh, the four-year process as well then Correct. for capital improvement. But okay. There for is, the there implementation, is, yes. There is, okay. with very few exceptions, no such thing as fast capital projects. Every once in a while, there are certain things and they're typically mayoral where the mayor says, we have a terrible problem with retaining walls. And so the mayor makes lots of money available and then a bunch of retaining walls, some of which are under the purview of DOT, some of which are under the purview of the parks department, some of which are under the purview of uh, the department of buildings. They get mayoral money and that often is fast tracked. Um, but it is unusual for a project like this to come under that kind of mayoral initiative. So the sad reality is that the capital process is really slow. Understood. Uh, so then going back to what Jennifer was saying, that's why it would be faster if it was privately funded because correct. there is no emergency funds correct. for things such as this. Correct. Um, next up, uh, Eva Lerner. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I'll try to make this very quick. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Councilwoman De La Rosa, for your time this evening. Um, I recognize that uh, the various improvement options are quite time intensive and lengthy, um, potentially budget intensive as well. And I know that there are affordable to free options like free mulch that the city apparently has available. I've been told that there's mulch in Central Park that can be accessed and utilized. Um, personally, I think that mulch would make a much better dog run anyway. It's a lot cleaner. It's a lot more uh, environmentally friendly. It'll be healthier for the dogs, uh, better sort of filtration for their various sanitary needs. So my question is, if there's a free option, is that something that we can pursue? And how could we potentially get moving on that? That's sure. So if, if there's if there's consensus about wanting the gravel moved entirely, um, that would be one thing. But if people want, you know, uh, uh, just the wood chips to go on top, um, we can get wood chips to add to the to the run. Could uh, it be a possibility of like adding, you know, as a basic sort of preliminary measure, intermediate measure, adding wood chips or mulch on top while we're actively working on this major capital improvement project. And then, you know, and this could be sort of like a stopgap to at least cover the ground where I think people are adding in the chat that, you know, the, the, um, are underneath the gravel is exposed. And obviously there have been, um, you know, safety concerns because of the lack of level. If this is a free option, could this be a stopgap measure we could pursue while engaging in a longer term capital investment project? Sure, I guess I would wanna check uh, to see if, you know, putting putting a mulch on top because it decomposes, if that's gonna trap anything, you know, within the within the gravel. Um, or it's going to cause, it's going to further exacerbate drainage problems. Sure. Um, and if it doesn't, we can certainly add, we can get gravel. That's what Rocky's Run has. That's what Fort Troyan Park has. That's what the small dog run in Inwood Hill Park has. Um, and it, as long as forestry has machines that are operating, that's something that a pile can be dumped and then, you know, volunteers can, can add it a, as needed. Yeah. And I know that, um, 
Obviously, the community is probably going to have differing opinions on this, and I'm certainly, I'm not going to speak for everybody, and I think that as a community, we would need to come together to agree to something like this, but it is nice to know that this could be an option. Sure. Um, the other piece I would want to know then is, would we be able to get a commitment from the parks department to replenish maybe quarterly or however often some of the other dog runs are being replenished, um, again, as continuing stopgap until we're able to do a major improvement? It's generally not a problem, but as I said, it depends on it's uh, a resource um, that it does have a, a limited supply. Um, if it's not being used elsewhere, we can get loads uh, from forestry, from horticulture and have Wonderful. them drop. Thank you so much. Sure. So just to have some clarity, is there consensus around the addition of gravel, uh, uh, the addition of wood chips? Because if people are uh, approve of that, do not have a dog. I have hamsters, so I don't feel qualified to speak to this issue. But I if, don't feel qualified to speak on behalf of the entire community either. I, 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 I certainly that. love that issue. I'm speaking I, for myself. I would certainly right. want to take this back to the other folks who have been involved in this. Yep. Made, a quick chat we can all discuss and circle back. Yep. But um, yes. what would be the best avenue for following up? I know Spencer has been sort of taking the lead on communicating with all of you. Would it be something you would want me to follow up on? How would we move forward with that? Sure, Eva, I can put my email in the chat if you want to email me. Wonderful. Um, Thank you so much, Jennifer. And it would be it would be helpful, uh, mindful of the time that it is 834 and I've got a couple of other uh, hands up and I know Spencer has his hand up for a second question. I've got a couple of panelists, um, but I would like to, we're not going to be able to do that this evening, but I would very much like for uh, a couple of representatives uh, from the dog run to possibly meet with Jennifer to talk about whether or not it's a good idea to use um, chips. That appears to be an available um, option, but I am seeing um, lots of different things in the chat regarding uh, how people feel about that. So I'd like to call on Edgar Flores, whose hand is next. Hi, good evening. Hi. Hi, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, my, well, first, one thing first, uh, just to let you know about the dog run, there was a person that was in charge of the dog run. Sadly, he passed away during the pandemic. Jennifer, you know him, uh, it was Anthony. And he was in charge mainly of the, of the, of the, of the dog room. He uh, gathered a group of people and they took care of, uh, of the dog room. Myself was one of them. Sadly, I don't have any more dogs, so I, I don't use the dog room uh, more. Uh, one solution for the for for the water on the dog run, uh, we used to do a channel uh, on the fence that it's heading to Heaven Avenue. That is the way the water just pour out of the dog run, and we can maintain the gravel on in the in the dog run. That's for that. Um, the thing, my question is more about things in the summer. I want to know if there is going to be either a campaign or uh, something to address uh, the parties that are getting out of control in the park. Because uh, it has been an increasing number of uh, objects brought to the park. Last time, last year, we had big tents in the lawn. Uh, I even saw a petting zoo inside the park. I don't know if there are permits for that. If there are permits for that, how how these people are getting accountable for what they left there because after they do these parties on the weekends, there's a lot of garbage on Mondays. I invite you to go at 5 a.m. because there is mountains of garbage, food, and especially in the areas where kids play. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that, and that also brings another problem that is going to be rodents. And I don't know if we're going to place cheap wood at the dog run, well, rodents can hide there. And I don't know if it is a hand, it, it, it is link either the, the two things. Uh, I wanna know what is going to be the process for to either slow down the, the amount of uh, parties at the park, 
I know everybody wants to be in the park. Summer is so nice. It is the time to be outdoors, but it is for everybody. Also the music, the music is, a, now, uh, I mean, it is culturally uh, fascinating to hear all the types of music, but at one point you cannot understand what is going on in the park. Because it is, it is, now it is like a contest of who brings the biggest sound system into the park, even live music into the park. And again, that, that, that is my question. So thank you very much, Jennifer, for, for being here. Sure. Um, Edgar, I can take your concerns back to the Park Enforcement Division. Some other people have contacted us about the uh, the the parties. Generally, tents, any kind of structure is not permitted um, in the park unless they have sort of a, 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 a contract with the Parks Department to put on a public event there. Um, so you can you can always call in a complaint to 311 or you can write uh, you can call central communications at the parks department I can I can put the um, uh, you know what I, I, I've been doing I've been doing a lot of reports we're, to 311. We're, really not, we're really not doing the crosstalk you asked a question you made some really valid points well, I, just, I just want to clarify that I, I did a lot of reports and nothing happens and this thing is increasing yeah to 311. Even well, with pictures. The, the noise complaints do go to uh, to the police, but I'll I'll follow up with the Parks Enforcement Division and see if we can't increase patrols, particularly at the start of the summer, to sort of set the tone. Um, and and with apologies, trash, we will we will have uh, additional staff this summer as part of the second shift in, initiative, um, so that will help get a jump start. So there will be less trash in the morning. But trust me, we know how much trash there is. My my staff has to pick it all up and haul it. Uh, to yeah, the and, 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 I, I'm, we're we're really I, we're really I, I, we're I'm really we're really, really not doing Edgar. We're really not doing crosstalk. I really dislike muting people when they're I'm just talking. complaining the staff because they do a lot of job. I'm just complaining. Thank the staff. you. Thank you for your help. Okay, so sorry to drag people to a second meeting, but I do want to circle back to something that I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, which is our, in April, we are going to be focusing on a lot of the security, sanitation, whatever kinds of issues in all of our parks, not just Jay Hood. So very helpful to know that there are particular concerns such as what Edgar raised. Um, and I encourage people to come back next month so that we can talk about some of those issues as well. Um, I do see that Spencer has his hand up, but based on having monitored monitoring the chat, there are two people who had a lot of questions in the chat, but did not raise their hands. So before I call on Spencer, I just want to see if Cindy B and if Carla Baez, who have been very active in the chat, would like to raise their hands and ask whatever is their question. Looking for Cindy B. Cindy, are you able to unmute? She says her audio doesn't work. Ah. Okay, so Cindy had some questions um, about the community center specifically, the recreation center. Um, she didn't actually say what exactly her questions were. So Jennifer and Carmen, if you can speak briefly to whatever concerns you know about in the rec center and whatever funding or capital needs are coming down the pike with that. I'm sorry to give that short shrift, but looking through the chat, I'm not seeing what is, uh, I think yes, is it too late? Is it too late to include the center with the dog run for the participatory process? Um, and it, at this moment it is, Liz. Um, we, we cannot add, first of all, they, because upgrade, there's- her, her specific question is upgrading the media center. So- okay. So I'll just say, thank you so much, Cindy, for bringing up the rec center. I actually did um, summer youth employment in the rec center and it's dear, near and dear to my heart. Um, and it definitely needs a facelift. Um, at this point in the participatory budgeting process, 
Um, we can't add that project in with the dog barn because they're considered two different projects. And also the costs have to be less than a million dollars for it to be a participatory budgeting eligible. That being said, um, I'm happy to connect with you offline. I will drop my email in the chat and Kiana's email in the chat who does budget for my office. We're happy to have that conversation with you and with Parks to see what would be the cost estimates for the uh, rec center upgrades and see you know, what was doable within this budget or future budgets. So I'm um, happy to chat offline and agree with you that it's a wonderful space and one that we need to upgrade. Thank you. Um, next, we've got Carla Baez. Hello. Yep, I can hear you. Hi, Liz. Hi. Um, more than a question, I just uh, wanted to thank uh, Ms. Carmen and Jennifer and also Friends of J-Hood for uh, this conversation. And um, we've been working very hard uh, to get the dog run improved. And I just wanted to thank them from coming in this platform where there's more people so we could have this conversation and for them to know that we will we will stay on this and uh, hopefully we could all get um, some solutions because um, as you can see, we're all very passionate and it will be present. So we will stick around. Thank you. Thank oh, you, Carla, for your advocacy you. and your commitment. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so and 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 Spencer, I'm I'm sorry, I do see you there, but the the house rules are everybody gets to talk once. So I do have um, two of my committee members who have had their hands up for like 15 people, and I just want to take a quick lap through them. So uh, Domingo, who hasn't spoken yet, I'm going to recognize you first. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Jennifer had a recommendation, you know, um, and seeing how uh, there's so many groups within parks. I know, uh, is it possible to do some sort of campaign? Like, let's say if you have a stewardship within a park, that there's at least some some uh, info cards all over the park. Like, let's say if you're interested in advocating for the park, hey, join your local stewardship group, I think would help not only uh consolidate a lot of the what seems to be fragmented efforts but also like uh be able to put people in communication lines with each other do you mean like a qr code like on a flyer like have j friends of j hood but look at doing that yeah. universally yeah because it's like like i for instance for me I, i've had a, a tough time identifying people for like wallenberg right like wallenberg playground has since the early 2000s that hasn't had anything happen to it but like let's say once a stewardship is developed right it seems like there's different groups but yet they're already organized factions within parks like being able to like do some sort of like qr code or like get involved with your park with your neighbors type of stuff you know what i'm saying so one universal resource is partnership for parks. They provide grants to community groups who want to do projects. You don't have to be a conservancy to get them. Um, they might provide tools for an It's My Park Day cleanup. They also provide technical assistance and provide coaching for different groups. Um, Friends of J. Hood Wright has gotten a series of grants from them. Um, oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying Jen, Jennifer because it's pretty difficult. As somebody who's trying uh, for several years, it's very difficult to work with partnership for parks. So um, we're trying to make the best of it. But I mean, like, if there's already a stewardship in place, could there be some sort of like identification within the park or areas within the park where it's like, hey, look, you got a local stewardship group here. Join your neighbors, as opposed to having 20 different groups working without knowing each other. Sure. So I know Friends of J. Hood Wright um, does outreach for their days um, in the park. Um, I'm not sure. I think New York City Mountain Biking Association probably does at Highbridge, but I'll take I'll take it back to partnerships to see if we can't better strategize to streamline so that those various groups get connected with one another. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that the person who logged on using the same link as Spencer is not Spencer. So would not Spencer Badesh 
who's logged on using that same link, please uh, unmute and also let me know what is your name? Hi, I'm Teresa Cervera. I am a dog walker. <clears throat> I spend a lot of my time in Jay Hood Wright Park. Okay. And uh, really sorry, by the way, for passing over you. It's I, okay. I thought it was Spencer. It's okay. Uh, my question was, if and when we get this approval to have an overall overhaul of the park, is there any community oversight from us on the budget? Because I was told that the one pallet we received, that $800 was spent on the shipping. And I heard this from people that work in the parks. And that's obviously an egregious waste of money. So are we going to have any say when we see the full budget? So the so what was what's done oftentimes is it's consolidated, right? Procurement for multiple sites, but that also means that that delays it. So if you want, if you need something for a specific park, you might try to expedite it for a one-time thing, and that's what we were doing for J Hood Wright. Um, multi, most of the time, to get an economy of scale, the city is doing. Um, uh, multiple sites, like say for the retaining walls or for procuring uh, garbage cans. Um, so, um, but then there are the instances where you want something quickly when, you know, Amanda got um, injured. Uh, so it was done differently. Not always the case. Yeah. Okay, so will, will we see the budget when it gets passed? Will we have any type of veto or approval on it? Or is that just on your well, guys? The budget end? isn't done isn't done by specific park. It's done by borough. So I don't know that you'd be able to tease out. Uh... So I'm actually going to jump in here. And um, on the one hand, if I'm understanding you correctly, Jennifer, if Parks is buying like a whole mess of gravel for a whole lot of places, then that's going to be a little more financially efficient. And there's a certain really bad irony that in trying to respond quickly to a stated need, there was a huge upcharge for shipping. So as not a dog owner, but a taxpayer, um, I appreciate that you, not you personally, but you know, you as an agency tried to move quickly, but it's a huge bummer that it cost that much money. So I just want to, I mean, I understand like kind of what happened there, but I think, um, yeah, that's just, that's a, that's an awful lot of money. And uh, thank you, Teresa, for raising that point. Uh, thank you to some of the people who mentioned this in the chat. And I just hope that there's some better and more efficient way to balance speed with cost savings. And I hope that if the answer is, well, then it has to be batch ordered, um, borough wide, what have you, that folks are forgiving about the time lag in consideration of the price. Like it's, you know, we want it fast and we want it cheap. And it sounds like we're not able to get both. Um, I'm not actually looking for an answer. Uh, I'm looking to validate the concern that, that Teresa raised and that many, many other people are echoing in the chat. Um, so with that in mind, I want to move back over to the panelists. Um, Can I say something, Liz, on the last yes. transparency part? Yes. Um, one of the bills that Council Member Shaker, who's the chair of the committee, has is a, a capital parks, um, capital project um, tracker. And it would create a system where there is detail on the capital project expense. Um, and, and the details of those projects. That does not currently exist. That has to be legislated. Um, it has to go through the legislative process. But one of the things that I want to say earlier, and I guess I'll say it now, um, I will share the, the bills 
um, to Liz as the chair of the Parks Committee, but I'll also share it to the group, those of you that we have emails for like Spencer. This is a great opportunity and a great moment right now for us to also mobilize our community for that campaign, which I mentioned at the beginning of the call, the 1% for parks. It's about equity, it's about transparency, but also legislative advocacy around these bills and getting them done in order to see the transparency that we need for our city. Like we are here to dismantle those systems and make them better and work for our communities. We're committed to that. Um, so I just wanted to give that plug. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Danny Bonilla, who also has not um, spoken, and then Daryl Cochrane, and then we're gonna close out. Nope, you gotta unmute, Danny. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I have a quick question um, for Jennifer, uh, and I'm, I forgot who was it that the house, uh, I think it was like the, the parks that they housed also the boating people as part of the umbrella of parks and recreation or something, if I'm not mistaken, if, is there any way that they can make like, and this might sound stupid, but like a dog association of like all the dog parks and like, I don't know, like have someone like find these like complaints like right away. It, I'm pretty sure it could be like managed by one or two people of just like having a list of like, oh, like there's like 50 dog parks, like, and just like seeing like, what is it that's like a, a priority, like having that as, you know, part of the umbrella of like, oh, like we have a association for dog parks that is being overseen by parks, you know, is there something like I'm actually that? Gonna, I'm actually gonna jump in. I think that's part of, I don't know if you were on at the beginning of the meeting, but when the council member talked about the suite of legislation that, uh, I forget, short dude, curly hair, Brooklyn, 33rd district, Lincoln, uh, Lester, something like that. Lincoln, Ressler. Lincoln, I was very close. Um, that he proposed part of that legislation speaks to the very lack that your question asks. Like, no, there isn't any overall monitoring, uh, public responsibility, parks department responsibility for dog runs. And that needs to be legislated and that needs to be funded. So okay. it's not a dumb question at all. And that's part of what that legislation um, seeks to seeks to address. I see. Okay, uh, that definitely answered my question. And and I also just want to say, I think uh, everyone at Parks and everyone uh, like uh, Carmen's office is is doing the best job that they can. And also all the people that lives out in those those areas and and are advocating for for the speedy process of bureaucracy and how slow things do move uh, and not only uh, just the dog park, everything else is like happening all at the same time. Um, and, I, and I just hope also too, and I encourage the people around there to like po quite possibly set up a uh, uh, GoFundMe and, and do the work. I, like, I remember I raised money for a, camp, for a mural that I painted with money from the community. So if I was able to do the work, someone else is definitely able to do the work. And dogs are cool. I like dogs. I don't have a dog. I have a cat right now. So. Cool. OK, uh, Daryl. Yeah, hi. Just real quick, unrelated to the, the dog run, but um, just so people know, about four or five years ago, I had put into our budget priorities for this committee. Um, and it's been maintained ever since. I think it keeps ticking up in, in the rankings. Uh, accessibility to the, the Overlook Plaza um, there at, at the, what is that? The Western, the Northwestern? Yes, yeah, the Northwestern corner. Corner of the park. Um, just to make that feature, which is one of the you know dominant features in the park, accessible to all so that's been something when we've been working on but you know any any additional pushes would be great 
I think yes. we do have a capital cost estimate for it at one point. So yeah. we can take that up for the community board prioritization. Okay. So, I mean, the good news is I think we had a pretty good conversation and everybody, although not everybody agrees and we, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really feel like we totally solved it. I mean, we certainly didn't solve everything. We didn't really solve very much, but I think we kind of got to a better understanding about why this stuff is important and the complicated bureaucratic environment in which capital funding uh, rests. Um, I, hope, I hope that you are more energized by the possibility of neighborly conversation with each other about difficult issues um, and the importance of working together on them, even though we don't always we don't always agree. Um, I hope that this inspires you to keep coming back to these meetings. You don't have to come every month, but I think that we get more done when we continue to have these kinds of conversations. Um, I, I did want to end this meeting at 8.30. It's now a couple of minutes to nine. I very much want to go have a beer with a friend of mine whose father died a couple of hours ago. Um, so barring up, uh, Steve, I'm going to let you have the last word. My longtime community board colleague and neighbor who also uh, works for the parks department and can probably address some of this capital stuff. And then I will um, respectfully ask for a motion to adjourn. Steve? Well, well, I could uh, go on about the capital stuff and clear up a lot of the issues, but uh, I don't think we have time for it at the moment. Uh, but, I, but I do think uh, uh, Carmen or someone from her office should tell people uh, when the uh, PB uh, vote will be taking place because I think- Hey! The, excuse me? Voting starts, sorry, voting starts March 26th through April 4th. And uh, there's gonna be, um, we're gonna put it out for the community. There's gonna be poll sites. All of that information is going to be released from our office this week, March 26th through April 4th. You can vote at your nearest poll site. Um, and so if you don't already, follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, and we will be releasing it via- those avenues as well as our email blast um, and with all the poll site information and everything. And, and would, would you recommend that the dog run group mobilize and uh, organize to vote in that? They're already, ballot? they're already mobilized and organized. So thank you all yeah. for being as persistent as you have been. Um, but definitely, yes, yes, come out and vote. Uh, participate in the poll, in the poll sites so that the community knows. And we look forward to funding and committed to working with the entirety of the community on our parks. Thank you. I do also want to say to the folks in the dog in the in the dog owners group um, and for who have really been advocating for the dog run. Um, you know, anybody with a dog, anybody who spent any time with someone who has a dog at a dog run gets how important dog runs are. I myself do not have a dog but I know plenty of people who do and I've hung out at dog runs and it is clear to me that this is, um, as someone earlier said, this is as vital a community asset and a community resource as playgrounds. Um, and it's not a difficult pitch to say to people, hey, we need to fix up blah, blah, park playground. Everybody gets that. Um, not everybody, and it's unfortunate, but not everybody gets why dog runs are so important. So I do urge you to um, go out there and, you know, evangelize on the value of dog runs. One of the things, there are lots of people, I mean, I've been on this board for a very long time and I've often been in sort of the middle of adjudicating arguments between people who are pro-dog and people who are anti-dog. And I don't like to put it that way, but that's just sometimes 
how it how it winds up reading. And folks who don't have dogs and who are inclined to say, "Ich, dogs, get get them out of here," do not understand the value that dog owners bring to a park in terms of activating the park, in terms of being in the park, in terms of keeping the park safe. So I can talk till I'm blue in the face, um, but folks who are dog owners and who for whom the dog run is really important, um, talk not only amongst yourselves, but also to your non-dog owning neighbors so that they can really understand why, yeah, a clean, sanitary, functional, nice dog run isn't some fluffy extra. It's just as important as computers and schools and as senior center furniture and as playgrounds and as all of the other things that um, people advocate for in terms of use of tax dollars in the participatory budgeting scheme and in the general budgeting as well. I know it sounds like I'm preaching the, to the converted, but I'm just I'm encouraging you to preach to the unconverted. And remind people the role you play in unifying the community, right? You're not only keeping the park safe and being a, a, an activator of the park, you're bringing together from people from all walks of life because you share your love of dogs and you meet up and you're sharing your dogs, you know, exchange and play playtime together. Cool. Danny, you can ask, yeah, can, yeah, can I ask all of that? Uh, two things real fast. Puppy therapy is real. And also power in numbers is real. This, uh, and, and with that being said, uh, uh, could a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? I need a committee member to second that motion to adjourn. Alexa, <laughs> somebody. Second, I, I was on mute, sorry. I second the motion. Second, second. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you all April 18th and at participatory budgeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Okay.